Well, welcome uh, to St. Columns tonight, uh, especially if you're here in the building, but also if you're with us online. Uh, it's fantastic to have you worship with us today. And today we're having the third uh, in our series uh, looking at Easter and resurrection. Um, and so it's really great to be reminded of these great truths uh, at this time of year uh, each year. Obviously, uh, our usual stuff, but I don't need to tell you, you all know. Uh, in these following responses, please, uh, if you can join me in the words in yellow, that would be great. Open our lips, O Lord, and we shall declare your praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Friends in Christ, we come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building up of his church. We will lift up our hearts in thanks and praise, hear from God's holy word, and pray for this world and for ourselves. The Bible tells us to approach God confidently through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we do so, we must confess our sins, seeking forgiveness through God's boundless goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. God of all mercy, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have compounded from your way. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed and have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of your spirit, that we may live the new life to your glory. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Grace and peace be with you. Well, please take this opportunity to pray uh, for the people around about you uh, just now and to bring them to God, uh, seeking God's peace uh, for each one. Well, God has been the God of all time, uh, and he is the ancient of days. Uh, he is worthy of our praise. So please stand as we sing together, blessing and honor to the ancient of days.
Please be seated. Well, as we meet together, uh, we meet together as a family in community, and it's always good to know what's going on. Uh, so our notices today, uh, this was this morning, so you've missed it, but um, thanks to those who did come along, and uh, there's going to be an opportunity. So we had a, a time after the morning service uh, where we heard back uh, some of the results of the survey that we did recently um, and just had some discussion about the, the things, about our values, uh, the things that we value as a church. And um, there will be opportunity uh, for everyone to contribute to that discussion. Um, if you look out next Friday in the e-news, uh, there's going to be a link to what happened this morning. So we recorded it um, this morning. And there's also an opportunity for you then just to email um, the office uh, with any thoughts that you might have. So I do encourage you to have a look at that um, and send in any thoughts that you have on that because it's really important that we have uh, everyone's views um, as, as part of our family uh, in doing that. So thank you. Alpha. Alpha starts this Tuesday. Uh, so we've done a, a letterbox drop uh, around the area. So please do pray that people um, respond uh, to that invitation to Alpha. Um, Alpha is open to anyone uh, to come along. So whether you're uh, already a believer in Jesus, but just want to develop that uh, a bit more and have a bit more understanding. It might be that you want to bring a friend uh, along to that. Uh, it might be that you are questioning stuff about life uh, and you want to come and explore together. Uh, it's a non-threatening environment in that there's no right or wrong answers to conversations. Uh, it's about having those conversations together and exploring together. Um, a barbecue is provided, um, so you know food is always good, and uh, lots of warm and welcoming people there. So uh, please maybe think about people that you might want to invite along uh, to Alpha on Tuesday. On Friday night, uh, there's an opportunity just to get together socially um, in the cafe again uh, on Friday at 6.30. Just bring um, some uh, meat or other food uh, that you would like uh, to have uh, and uh, we just share a meal together and just get to know uh, other people in the church. So it's, um, it's not a late night, you know, 6.30 till around about 9, 9.30, um, but do come along. It's an opportunity just to spend time with people. Next Sunday uh, is Anzac Day. Uh, and so we'll be having um, two services next Sunday. So the morning service uh, is going to be a traditional uh, Anzac communion service. Um, where we will um, think about uh, the significance of Anzac Day uh, in the context of our Christian faith. Um, and also in the evening, um, we're going to be having a church in the cafe again next week. So it's the fourth Sunday of the month. Um, and I believe there's going to be a bit of an Anzac uh, focus uh, within that as well. So uh, please do uh, think about coming along to either one or both of those services. They'll be quite different um, in their style, um, so it would be great to welcome you to those. Now, this is coming earlier than you usually anticipate in the service, um, but it's over to Naomi for our memes and graphs of this week. All right, let's, so let's have a look at our memes today. So um, you might have to think about this one for a bit. I did. But did you know that no matter what way you spell misspelled, the end result will always be misspelled? And uh, so um, this is an art, um, classic artwork. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be Hercules wrestling a lion or uh, Hercules attempting to give his cat a pill. Um, it could go either way. And uh, this one is a, has a, there's a bit of a series on this one, so there's a bit of a story behind this. So, this. so there's a couple of stores that are across from the street from each other in, in Christenberg, and um, uh, there's a, a music store and a shoe store. And uh, the music store is, they both have like the signs in front of their stores, and the music store puts up a sign and says, hey, super shoes. 
uh, want to start a sign war, and uh, Super Shoes responds by putting up a sign that says, uh, no. um, so I can't, I can't read it, I know I chose the meme, but. Yeah. Hey, music store, uh, our shoe strings are stronger than your guitar strings. Um, so then the next one, the music store responds with, well, your shoe strings never got anyone a date. At which point the shoe store responds with, keep your play dates, we speci specialise in soulmates. Um, so that's the latest, most recent one that I've discovered. There may be more coming up, I don't know. We'll see what happens. This is apparently still ongoing, so, um, yeah. So, uh, so um, yeah, this is a name pun. So we've got William Shakespeare shaking there and William Stillspear staying still. So, yeah. And for our spurious correlation for this week, We've got number of people who were electrocuted by power lines correlates with death, deaths caused by lightning. So there's kind of a bit of a common theme there um, that they're, they're both about electrocution, but you know where the electricity comes from is. So yeah, I don't know what's going on there, but that's our correlation for this week. Yeah, well, it looks like the trends were both people are both are less. Less people are getting struck by lightning and less people are being electrocuted by power lines, so who to figure? So. All right, so um, I'll also be leading the prayer, so. Dear God, uh, we thank you that you have given us certain hope in this life and the next. We pray that you will help us respond appropriately to the promise that we to the promises that we can live a transformed life both in response to and anticipation for the, their fulfillment. We pray for the Catherine Christian Convention later this month and uh, we pray for those of us who will be uh, attending that this year. We pray for we also pray for the Galway mob and uh, the um, and and uh, who will also be there, that we'll be able to maintain, to continue our relationship with them and show love and support for them. We pray for safety in, in our travel for everyone attending um, from wherever they're coming from. And uh, we pray for protection from evil spirits amongst the indigenous people, uh, both those in uh, rural areas and uh, those in urban areas. And we pray for peace between between the different groups in the town of Minyeri, that there can be uh, be uh, peace and peace there, Lord. We pray for uh, our cricket ministry. Thank you that we have such an abundant ministry, um, and we just pray that you'll help us, um, guide us, and be with us as we work out the direction that is going. Uh, we pray for fun and fellowship um, that will continue there. And, we'll, and we also pray for wisdom and how we can use this ministry in a way that pleases you, Lord. Um, and uh, we pray um, as we work out what our values want to be, as we pr prepare our strategic plan, we pray that you'll be part of this process, Lord, and, um, and that you'll guide us uh, to, in a direction that pleases you. Um, help us... Help us strive towards your kingdom values, not just in words on a, on a website, but in, our, but in the words we speak, in our deeds, and, and how we live our day-to-day -day lives. We pray for this both as individuals and also as a community together. And Lord, we pray for the world. Um, we pray for uh, the way we've treated, uh, treated this planet. Um, and we just pray that um, we, you'll help us find a way forward from here. Um, and uh, we also pray for, um, for the, we pray for those impacted by the violence occurring in Myanmar and elsewhere in the world. We pray for um, your peace and sovereignty to rule over. 
um, the world, Lord, uh, and that, um, that you can be there in that situation and stop the violence and b b bring justice as well, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, our passage today um, is one that uh, is sometimes a bit of a challenging one uh, to, to look at. Um, and we know that uh, in all the things that we do, um, in the things that we wrestle with, uh, sometimes we might have doubts, sometimes we just don't know the answers to things, um, that uh, God is with us um, and that his love will lead us through. And so we're going to now sing um, our next song, uh, which uh, is a reminder of that um, and a prayer uh, to God um, as we come to our time of reading. So please stand as we sing.
Please join with me as we pray uh, this prayer together. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our reading uh, today is from Luke chapter 20. Uh, starting at verse 27. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, my name is Stephen Hale. I'm the acting vicar here at St. Columns. Uh, in 2019, in November, I had the privilege of preaching twice in North America, and I thought this would be, you know, my big moment when finally finally crack a global audience. Uh, and I was attending the EFAC, which is an Anglican Fellowship Conference in Birmingham, Alabama, in the deep south of America. And they kindly invited me to give uh, one of the sermons during one of the daily services, which they in America call a homily. Uh, and the set reading for the day was the beheading of John the Baptist. So I was thinking, oh, this is my big moment in North America, and I have to preach on the beheading of John the Baptist, which, you know, it happened, and it's an important historic event, but doesn't kind of lead to a lot of possibilities in terms of saying anything that's other than what needs to be said. And then I preached, I'm not saying this to boast, this is just what happened. I then preached in Pittsburgh Cathedral because I was staying with some friends. And the set reading was the one that we just had, which is a very rarely read reading and uh, one that some would consider to be obscure. There's one line in it that people are familiar with and the rest people, most people wouldn't even know what it was. So. That's what we're thinking about tonight, because we're in this post-resurrection focus, and that's what we're, not post-resurrection, post-resurrection of Jesus focus, uh, and that's what we're going to be doing. Now, I wonder, most of us, I imagine, if we had a little conversation about it, do have some sort of vision of what we think the afterlife will be all about, the life that we will be living after we live on this earthly lot, and we move into glory or whatever term you want to use for it. And I mean, in fact, most Australians, if you had a conversation, have got some sort of vague notion or idea about what that's all about. It may not be a very helpful idea or notion, but um, they'll have some ideas of pearly gates and 
uh, you know, clouds and angels and a range of other things. Uh, if you're a minister, you get involved in taking funerals, and one of the things that people most, in fact, the only thing that people really want you to say at a funeral, apart from the fact that Fred or Mary was an amazing person, uh, is that they've gone, they've gone to God and they're actually in eternal life. I mean, there is an incredibly profound, palpable sense of expectation that that's what you will convince, you, you will say <laughs> as part of the Anglican, an Anglican funeral service. Now, sometimes that's incredibly easy to do and other times it's not nearly as clear cut, I can tell you. Uh, and the Anglican funeral liturgy is incredibly carefully worded so that it doesn't overpromise and it doesn't underpromise, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, well, these days, more and more Australians are choosing to have secular funerals and they'd rather have a celebration in a pub or some other event than rather a church service, and that reflects the sort of secular drift of our context and our age. Uh, most of you probably don't read a newspaper. Do you, are you familiar with the concept of a thing called a newspaper that is printed and that people read? Does anybody here read newspapers? I mean, I'm ancient, I do. Um, so, uh, but in newspaper, the Sunday, Saturday, Good Weekend magazine in The Age, they always have a little thing at the end run by Benjamin Law where he asks various people uh, to roll a dice and there are seven topics that they can come up and they only talk about three of them. And one of the seven topics is death. And it is kind of surprising how often that topic seems to come up. If it's anybody here read this? So there's two of us here. We can talk about this after. That would be good, you yeah. um, know. So... Uh, anyway, death often comes up, and it's very interesting, I always think, to sort of see what people say about death, because an incredible number of people are amazingly convinced that there is no life after life. It's just that when you die, you die, and that's it. Uh, now, how they actually can be convinced about that, we don't know, do we? Because no one knows in the end what's going to happen until that actually does happen, and most of those people who are making these opinions haven't yet had that experience yet. So it is, in fact, a kind of a challenging uh, issue. Similar, related to all of that, I read this book called God is Good for You, which was in the top 10 bestseller list of books in 2018, I think, by Greg Sheridan, who's the foreign correspondent for the Australian newspaper and News Limited, uh, another newspaper, I'm sorry about that. Um, and he, in this book, he talks to a number of eminent Australians about faith, because he's trying to mount a case for the fact that, in fact, to be a Christian person of faith is a good thing, uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, now, one of the people that he talks to is a former Prime Minister of Australia uh, and a person who uh, attended some theological studies, that person who participated in theological studies, their name shall remain nameless. And uh, when asked about the question of what they think about the afterlife, I'm just trying to find it here, I did have it marked. Um, so, uh, Yes, he says, will we face judgment? He says, this person says, yes, we will be judged, but I think we'll be judged benignly. I think there would be a very few people, only a few people, who consistently choose evil, who would find themselves in hell, maybe even Hitler or Stalin. Uh, that's a kind of an interesting view, is it not? Uh, and he, he says about the afterlife, he says he believes in life after death, but he doesn't know the details of what it will be like. Well, that's not a surprising answer, don't you think? But... That's what he said. Now, there is an eminent Australian who is quoted in this book who's a member of this church, and I shall, for various reasons, choose not to see, to comment on what they, they uh, said. You can find that for yourself. Another eminent Australian who was a former leader of the opposition uh, said this. He said, is there life after death? I hope so. I certainly hope that there's something after death. I accept that we are accountable for our lives. And uh, last but not least, another former prime minister uh, put it this way. And again, I'm having trouble reading, seeing it here. Where does he say this? Uh, about what he thinks about all of this stuff. Um, and I can't find it, so I'll skip that bit. Kind of the interesting, oh, here it is. See, so does he believe in life after death? Yes, I do. I don't know what in, in what form. Let me turn the question around. Do I believe that literally your life is snuffed out at death and there is absolutely nothing after? No. But what life after death looks like, that truly is a mystery. I guess we'll all find out at some point. Now, it wouldn't be surprising if there were lots of people who held those views, wouldn't it? That, like, we do believe in life after death, but there's not much you can say about it, and we'll actually have to wait until we get there to work out what it's all about. Well, my purpose tonight is to actually talk about this particular passage, but also to think about what life after death might be like. 
because I think if you're a Christian person, you ought to have a sense of a vision for what that might be like, because I do, in fact, think it has implications for the way in which we live today, uh, which is what we're thinking about. Now, the Sadducees come to Jesus and they are seeking to trick him up uh, because they're wanting to ask a trick question to which they already know the correct answer. It says in verse 27, some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Uh, that Sadducees were a group of people who believed uh, that they had to draw their faith from the first five books of the Old Testament, what was called the Pentateuch. And if you couldn't validate it or find it in the Pentateuch, then it wasn't actually worth worrying about and certainly wasn't something that they would consider to be kosher or orthodox. Now, we all have resorted at one point in time or other to a what-if question, have we not? Uh, maybe when you were a, you know, irritating teenager, you might have done it more. I certainly did. I was a painfully teenage, you know, irritating teenager who was always trying to be provocative in conversations. But we've all done it. Uh, the militarist says to the path path pacifist, pacifist right? what if someone was attempting to rob you and your family, would you fight back? Or the child asks the mother, what if, if the world were, were to end tomorrow? Would you really make me do my homework tonight? Or the skeptic asks the believer, what if there's no God? Would you still pray? Karen, my wife's a teacher and she teaches at an Anglican girls' school and at parent-teacher interviews virtually every year, she has someone who comes up who gives the impression that they've thought of the question that no one has ever, ever asked before. Like, it's never, this question's never been asked before, which is like, how come you're forcing my daughter at your Anglican school to have religious education classes? You know, surely that we shouldn't be doing that sort of stuff. It's just ridiculous. Uh, and Karen, my wife, who's had this question virtually at every parent-teacher interview for 20 or 30 years, uh, always says, well, you did enrol your child in an Anglican school. I'm not sure what you're expecting. Um, and that's kind of how it goes there. But they're trying to trick her up, really, thinking that the religious classes are a waste of time. Well, uh, the question goes like this. So, Jesus, Moses wrote about, asked about for us about how to handle a situation if a married person dies without producing ch children. The wife, according to the law, is to remarry one of her brothers-in-law in order to have a child. But what if this happened and a woman married all seven brothers and never had any children with them? Who would she be married to in the resurrection? Do you get the drift of the question? I mean, it's seemingly a very silly question, isn't it? Uh, and it's hard to imagine the circumstances in which this might actually happen. Uh, I did mention this morning as an aside that I went, uh, as a bishop, once had a letter from a person who was seeking permission for their fourth marriage. Uh, and they'd been in a retirement village for, for the two previous marriages and they were wanting to marry a third person from the same retirement village. It was a little interesting situation. Uh, but not quite what we're talking about here. So uh, that's the trick question. Whether the Sadducees refer to an old Mosaic law that had never really ever been enacted, and it's a trick question because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. But there was also a practical pastoral dimension to it. Who was going to keep the family name? I mean, if you did marry seven times and you didn't bear a child, well, who keeps the name going? Uh, and in many cultures, that's a very big issue and a very important uh, matter of responsibility. Well, as Jesus, Jesus, as is his wont, doesn't engage with the question, but he goes straight to the heart of the matter. And what a surprising response it is. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. Now, in any age, people are involved in marriage, uh, in the giving and taking of marriage, are they not? In just about every culture. Uh, it may be more complicated in the age in which we live because of uh, changes to legislation, but nevertheless, people still get married, and there's still a certain amount of fascination with the issue of marriage. Uh, I have to confess that I have never watched marriage at first sight because I consider it to be evil and dangerous, um, but there may be some here who would need to give personal confession later on. Uh, and Kirsty and I will be available on the, that side over there if you need to come and admit that you have actually watched. You wouldn't believe the people who do watch it, uh, but that's another issue. Uh, so that's, it's a, it continues to be a big issue. Well, Jesus is here is giving, I think, us an, a unique insight in the life to come. And as Christians, we do intend to indeed believe in life after life. We don't believe that when you die, that's it. Uh, that you just snuffed out and there is no more. You just become, 
you know, dust, and that dust goes into the ground and plants and other things grow out of that. If we are God's children, we are children of the resurrection. And just as Jesus died and rose again, we believe that we will die physically and after death we will be raised again physically. Life after life starts today. The resurrection life isn't just something that happens when you die and then you go to glory. It actually starts now because Christ brings us into new life through the Holy Spirit today. And through the Holy Spirit, we get to live a new life in a new way. And that goes on into eternity after our death. So life after life starts today with Christ and continues on into eternity. And our physical death at some point is but a stepping stone into a whole new future. To reinforce his point, Jesus refers to the patriarch Moses, because for his audience, the Sadducees, Moses was a pretty big deal. And in referring to Moses, Jesus undermines the question from the Sadducees. The Sadducees believed that a teaching, a belief, a practice, or a habit was not authentic unless it was found in the first five books, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. And they would search those books and therefore have to draw something from them. And Jesus reminds them of the incident of the burning bush. You may recall the incident where Moses confronts this bush that's burning, but the bush itself is not being consumed by the fire. Uh, And when Moses kind of is perplexed by this, it's part of the point at which God calls him to become the person who will uh, rescue the people of Israel by bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. And uh, Moses uh, says to God, uh, to, to God, he says, who am I to say, send me? And God responded, tell them that I am sent you. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of of Jacob. So when Jesus responds to the Sadducees, he reminds them of the story. God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. What we do in the here and now is important, and God will take care of us when our time does come. Now, you may think of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses as being dead, but in actual fact, they're alive. They are resurrected people who have gone to be with God in glory, Uh, And if you get to be a part of that in the future, you'll get to be with them as well. So so the Sadducees, in their strict conformity to the theological persuasion that they actually were committed to, were unable to realise that the God of uh, Isaac, Jacob and Moses was standing in front of them because this was God become flesh in the person Jesus Christ. So what do we make about this very unusual dialogue? Well, I think we see here that Jesus believed in and taught of a forthcoming physical resurrection. We see that he believed that in the life to come, there will be continuity with this life because when we get to glory, we will be recognizably identifiable as the people that we are. If you were to ask the question, where is Jesus at present? Well, he's in his physically resurrected body, having ascended to glory, sitting at the right-hand side of the Father physically, and is interceding, we're told, on behalf of the saints. He hasn't become disembodied, he continues to be an embodied person. So there will be continuity, but there will, it won't all be the same. At present, we live by faith and not by sight. And in the life to come, we will be gathered together with Jesus face to face. At present, we pray and we read the scriptures and we seek to hear God speak, and we seek to re- respond to him by living our lives in response to his word, and trusting him prayerfully as we go about our day-to-day lives. When we actually get to be in glory, we will be gathered in his presence and he will speak to us directly and we will be able to respond to him directly and we'll be able to acknowledge and worship him visibly, physically, and in a big communal gathering with many countless thousands or billions of people. At present, we struggle with sin and temptation, but in the life to come, we'll be fully transformed and fully renewed. And more specifically, we can see from Jesus' teaching here that marriage is a gift from God given from human flourishing. It's given for the mutual companionship, but also for human reproduction. It's for the good ordering of community. And yet we also see that it will be unnecessary in the life to come. Uh, And and in the future, we will be experiencing a fuller form of human community as part of God's renewed people dwelling in God's renewed planet. Now, all of the things that currently divide us will be overcome. Racial tension, hatred, hostility, war, rage, and malice. We won't be defined by our sexuality and we will enjoy true intimacy with one another. Young and old, women and men, those who are sort of um, important or seemingly significant, those who are seemingly insignificant, 
those who are rich, those who are poor, those from any range of ethnic backgrounds uh, reflecting the diversity of our planet. The rage and anger that is so much a characteristic of our contemporary culture will no longer be there and the tension within the church over many issues will evaporate because we'll no longer be arguing about things, we'll be gathered together in God's presence. Does this somehow dishonour and diminish marriage in our current lives? Because you could infer that, that it that does, doesn't, couldn't you? That somehow if you're saying there's no marriage in heaven, that therefore marriage is less valuable or less important. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, as it says in the prayer book, marriage is to be honoured by all and no one should enter into lightly or selfishly but responsibly and joyfully with mutual respect and the promise to be faithful. At the same time, I think it also means that we don't build our entire world around our marriage. If you are privileged enough to be married, as I am, uh, it's a great blessing and a great joy. But you don't build your entire world around your marriage. It's an incredibly unhealthy thing to burden your marriage with uh, because it's too big a burden for one person to have to live with. You need to have a healthy marriage which involves others and is rich and generous in the way in which you express it. So we commit to and we invest in, but we also need to keep it in perspective. Friendship with others is vital for a healthy marriage. Christian worship and service should be a key feature of family life. Christian community should be a key group that a healthy family, Christian family, will be committed to and actively a part of. And churches should model the life to come by being places where people of any background are genuinely welcome. Single people shouldn't ever be viewed as somehow second-class citizens or people that we feel sorry for, but people there who should sense and know that they're fully welcome and fully included in the people of God. And they should find rich fellowship and rich friendship within the context of Christian community. Now, none of that can be assumed. They're the ideals, but that, in fact, is what we ought to be working towards as God people. Now, interestingly, one of the defining views of our age is inclusion, is it not? if not the defining value of our age. And the biggest sin really is an act of exclusion uh, whereby someone doesn't feel fully included. Well, this vision of this future human community is one that's incredibly inclusive, isn't it? Uh, and one that I think we ought to be holding out more because I think it paints a picture of what God has in mind for us, uh, which is this incredible privilege that we will get to enter into. Jesus puts it this way, it says, those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will be the ones who get to be a part of God's new future today, but also when they die and go to glory. Well, how can you be considered worthy? Now, surely none of us in ourselves are worthy, uh, especially of the age to come and of the resurrection from the dead. It's not something you can earn. It's not something that you can do. To actually achieve uh, this outcome, it's something that you're given or blessed with. To be worthy of the coming kingdom, one has to first acknowledge one's own unworthiness. And in ourselves, we don't deserve to be a part of this exciting new future. In fact, we deserve the opposite. We live in a fallen world where we are all aware of our frailties and failures. Both individually and communally, we don't measure up. But fortunately, we believe in a God of grace who, through the loving action of Jesus, did die to reconcile us to himself so that we could be counted worthy uh, because of his death on our behalf and him standing in our place rather than us, God considering us, he considers Christ. And in that way, we get to be counted worthy of this coming kingdom. Now, we're all familiar with the invitation to come to Jesus and you'll be saved. Uh, I certainly heard that again and again and again when I was a teenager and eventually when I was 16 after I'd had a period when I walked away from it all, I made a response to Christ and gave my life to Jesus uh, and invited him to come into my heart and my life. Uh, and the promise of eternal life goes with that invitation. Now, there is a certain percentage of the com Christian community, uh, principally in North America, who actually have leveraged off that very basic and important idea to basically suggest that all you have to do is give your life to Jesus, ask him to turn, to repent you, to forgive you for your sins, you will have eternal life and you can just do what you feel like in the meantime until you go to glory because God's forgiven you through Jesus. You kind of familiar with this concept? Uh, and that leads to really unhealthy consequences. If we do in fact believe in a life to come and life after life and we believed in a renewed 
uh, world that God is going to bring us into, which we'll live in and dwell in in that new future, then that should mean that we're committed to a renewed planet and playing our part in the planet being renewed today. If we actually are passionate about justice and would like to see justice done in, our, in the future, when God brings about the final judgment, that means we should be passionate about justice in this world today, as we have opportunity and where we can play our part. Uh, where we, if we're passionate about creating communities of love that are genuinely inclusive, where people feel welcome, uh, we don't just sort of think, well, isn't it gonna be nice when I get to glory? We ought to be actively a part of creating a world and a community like that today. I mean, you could go on and on, but there are significant implications of believing in this life to come in terms of how we live today. If you are privileged to be married, that means you should cherish your marriage and invest in that marriage, but you also ought to hopefully have a marriage that is a blessing to others as you've been blessed. So tonight, I hope you've been encouraged to think a little bit more about what it might mean to live this life to come and what it might look like. And I think that's an area we need to think about a bit more because one of the critiques of Christian faith that some, some people is it's all just about this sort of thing down the track that you get if you give your life to Jesus and it really is a complete waste of space in between. That oughtn't be the case. We ought to live transformed lives that become truly, fully transformed and renewed when we do, in fact, go to glory. Amen. I invite you to stand. We have an opportunity now uh, to share with uh, Christians through the centuries, uh, but also around the world, uh, as we uh, say together um, the things that we believe in. So if you believe the things that are written on the screen, then please do say them with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. There he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, our last song uh, reminds us that we do live indeed in the shadow of this glorious cross, uh, and that we live each day uh, in the context of eternity. Uh, so please join us as we sing. In the shadow of Gloria's cross, come how by grace to pass my God the lost may your name forsaking all for your own fame your hymn of grace over me abounding forth in glorious dreams my thirst is
pray together. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Well, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Cool. Thanks for being at church tonight. Um, I haven't got the kettle on, but there are chocolates up the back. And, um, and a reminder that next week we'll be across in the cafe.